so this talk is mostly going to be uh, about um, the system that we built on top of Namecoin. How many people are familiar with Namecoin? So a bunch. So some of the lessons that we learned and why we ended up uh, moving to the Bitcoin blockchain and what is the new system that we have built uh, on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. So this is you know, roughly uh, what the talk is about. For people who don't know what we do, uh, so I'm just going to do a very quick uh, recap. So this is Werner Vogel's blockchain ID, right? Uh, looks just like a profile, you know, it could be any website where you go, you make this profile. Uh, the interesting thing about this profile is that only Werner actually owns the username and the profile data with a private key. So everyone here knows about Bitcoin, just like you know you have a private key, and that gives you exclusive access to spend the money in your account. Similarly, for this profile, only Vernal can actually do anything with this account, right? He has access to both the username and also the data. How this works in, in the background, so this screenshot is actually from the system when we were uh, still on Namecoin. Right? Uh, initially, there is a name new operation where you're just announcing a hash. So you don't want to tell people what is it that you're trying to announce because someone can try to uh, register that name themselves because the transaction is not confirmed on the network yet. So first you try to basically announce a hash, not really saying what exactly it is that you're trying to announce, and then you reveal it. And after that, everyone is basically sure that you got that unique piece of name. Right? And after that, you can actually update that information. I'll go over that process again. Uh, but I just w at this point, I just want you guys to know that uh, this is just a rendering of this data. It's just a JSON format. You know, the profile looks a certain way, and you can display it however you want. And this was the data, in the case of Namecoin, that it was actually written literally in the blockchain. Right? So all of the, the they were using blockchain also as a data store. Right? So think of it as a key value store. The key is um, the username, and the value is, is, is the data that is, that is being written. Conceptually, it works something like this. That you can think of the blockchain having a sense of time. Uh, when new blocks comes, it's like a clock tick. So time moves forward. And it obviously has a sense of ownership. People can own assets uh, like digital money or things like a profile uh, with a private key as well. Right. And, 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 and the generic process is very similar. You first do, uh, first announce that I want to register something. It's a hash. You don't want to announce exactly what it is that you want to register. Then you do a reveal. Like once you have seen like six confirmations or more, you know that everyone has seen that my private key now owns this hash. Then you reveal that this hash was actually this username, let's say Muneeb, that I was trying to register. Um, and then after that, you can, you can do name updates and, and so on. So uh, what is one name? One is, uh, is quite simply one registrar that helps people easily get a blockchain ID. Right? So we initially register the name for you and then transfer it to the Bitcoin address that you own. Right? So one name is, is, uh, is just acting as GoDaddy or Namecheap in this case. Right, that we first register and then we just transfer it out and we help you uh, manage the account itself. Right? So one is also building a lot of open source software that powers the underlying infrastructure as well that I'm going to talk about next. Uh, a, a little bit about Namecoin for those people who are not familiar. It was the first fork of, of Bitcoin and they basically forked the main Bitcoin code and added a bunch of new name ops. Right? So they added the ability to do a name new, uh, name register, name update, name transfer, and things like that. Right? So, so think of them as uh, it has all of the functionality of Bitcoin, but they added new uh, operations to the core code. Right? And their initial motivation was actually to build something uh, that could be an alternative to the domain name system. Right? They were really driven by that motivation. Uh, they wanted this domain dot bit that does not exist in ICANN DNS. And this was supposed to be a blockchain based uh, uh, top level domain that the resolution for dot bit domains would occur 
on the blockchain and not by the traditional DNS servers. Right. Uh, so Namecoin started in roughly, I think, 2011. Uh, at some point, you know, the main developers kind of like left the project, then some other developers picked it up, and they've actually done a lot of hard work, right, uh, on Namecoin, and, and they deserve a lot of credit for being the first system that actually showed that you can build, uh, how many people are familiar with uh, Zuko's Triangle? Uh, so Zuko's Triangle basically says that you, uh, if there are these three properties, that names can be human readable, which means that a Twitter-like handle, right? Like it's human readable, you can, you can recognize it, that Fred Wilson, Ed Wall, whatever, right? Uh, the second thing is that it, the system is decentralized. Very simple, meaning that you know, there is no central party that has any authority on the system. The third property is a tricky one, that the system is also secure. And by secure, what uh, Zuko meant was that only one person or, or a, a private key can actually own that name. It's not that someone registered Naval and then somebody else could just override it and, and, and get that name. And, and the triangle was that you can only pick two properties. Right? So what the Twitter gives up on decentralization. That it's a centralized company, but it can give you human readable names. And uh, so Namecoin was the first system that kind of showed that they've kind of squared the triangle, that you can have all three. Right? And uh, I feel like that, that was a very interesting contribution uh, that they made. With that said, uh, when we were launching our system uh, back in March of 2014, Namecoin was the fastest route to deployment. Right? They already did most of the work that we needed at the blockchain level, and we basically built the missing pieces on top of that. Right? So fastest route to, develop, to deployment, we used Namecoin, and then uh, there were a bunch of challenges that kind of guided our decision to move away from Namecoin. The biggest one was uh, that in December of last year, we started noticing that a single miner, uh, F2 Pool, also known as Discuss Fish, had around 52 or 53% mining power. That was not the scary part. The scary part was nobody noticed. Right? If this happens on Bitcoin, r slash Bitcoin would be talking about it. Right? Like there, people would be crying out loud that one mining pool has uh, more than 51% mining power. Nobody noticed in December. So we, we were actually like sitting on this data thinking what to do because our production system at that time was built on Namecoin. So we started an implementation of a Namecoin-like system that was actually built on Bitcoin. Right? And we are really glad we did, because by the time we uh, launched the production system, the situation was actually much worse. Uh, this is a more recent graph, and you will see, actually this is not a more recent graph. <laughs> I, I have a worse one, where you would see that most of the weekly mining distribution, uh, Discus Fish is like, above 60%, and that's the status right now, today. Uh, so the, I actually talked to Namecoin developers about it, and they actually think that they will be able to convince other miners to start mining Namecoin, and they will be able to bring this down, right? So that's, that's their point of view. Uh, we believe that there seems to be something fundamentally wrong with merged mining, that there isn't just enough incentive there for miners to mine an altcoin, uh, and especially to keep up. Uh, so the deployment cost of maintaining that software and running it is non-negligible, right? Like, it's not free money. You, you have to still put in some develop, uh, dev time uh, to be able to keep up with any changes that, that are happening. So that, that was the number one reason, the security of the blockchain, but there were a bunch of other things as well that I'll uh, just quickly go over. Uh, yeah, so now it's like much worse. The next was the reliability of the network itself. Right? Um, most people here, have, has anyone ever tried sending transactions on altcoins other than Bitcoin? So my guess is the number of hands would go down, right? Like most people just deal with Bitcoin and even on Bitcoin sometimes, you know, your transactions are not confirmed or something's going on. There's some sort of attack on the network. Things are much worse on, in the altcoin domain, right? Uh, so I'll just point out one instance uh, so I'm not showing data points for block confirmation times below 40 minutes because that's roughly normal between 10 to 40 minutes. These are all the outliers where the block confirmation time is actually like what it's, it's like really long. And this period 
last year, end of August or September, was when uh, there was a bug in the software that was making the miners crash. And it was taking up to 250 minutes for transactions to go through, right? And if this was Bitcoin, again, people would be crying and they, were, they would try to fix that bug because uh, there's a lot of financial capital that is tied to being able to send transactions on the main Bitcoin network. Uh, this largely went unnoticed, like very few people were working on it. It took like around four weeks to resolve. Uh, and, and the lesson there is that at the very base layer, at the, la at the layer of where you care about consensus and you care about reliability of the network, there's really no other alternative to Bitcoin right now. Right. Um, so that convinces us more that we need to be on the main journey. <clears throat> Uh, I, I wouldn't go into too much detail on uh, other problems with Namecoin. Uh, one of them is the limit on the data size because they were putting uh, data literally in the blockchain. So a single key value pair could have a max of 520 bytes. Uh, and, and, and a funny thing uh, about the limit of 520 bytes is that it was actually not 520 bytes. If you tried putting 520 bytes, you would end up losing access uh, to the key pair that you were trying to register. And I did that uh, with my co-founder, Ryan. So his name, Ryan, was registered on the blockchain and he could never access it because of a bug in Namecoin. Uh, so uh, another lesson, try using uh, test names before actually playing around with real uh, values. Anyway, so uh, obviously it leads to blo blockchain bloat. You can't register like tens of millions of users on the blockchain when all the data is also literally in the blockchain. Uh, and, and, and there are other software engineering challenges. In general, uh, Bitcoin has a much healthier ecosystem, both in terms of uh, the main code, but also all of the developers who are building tools or APIs around it. And, um, it, it, it makes a ton of difference if you're actually building systems on, on, on top of it. So uh, that leads us to Blockstore. In a, in a very simple sense, it's our implementation of Namecoin on the Bitcoin blockchain, but I'll go over how, what are the changes we made and how uh, we think it's a much superior system. So first of all, we use the Bitcoin blockchain uh, basically as a reliable broadcast mechanism, right? Our protocol operates at a layer above, which we are calling the virtual blockchain. Basically what happens is that the, a block store daemon would look at all the transactions being announced or broadcasted here, and it will throw away every tra transaction that has no valuable information for our protocol. Right? It will only look at the transactions that have these specific operations in OpReturn and uh, pick them up and try to construct this virtual blockchain from there. Another way to look at this is that we rely on the Bitcoin blockchain for getting, giving us total ordering on the operations for our virtual chain, right? Like we don't have to worry about uh, any consensus issues because the Bitcoin blockchain is solving those for us, right? Once you have that, you actually get total ordering of all name operations in the virtual chain. So I can very easily say that the name registration for Muneeb uh, with my private key as the owner came before another attempt of name registration that someone did because the Bitcoin blockchain is agnostic to those transactions. That transaction will get accepted at the Bitcoin layer, but it will get rejected at the virtual blockchain layer. And, and, and we believe that by doing this, the, the principle that we are, we are trying to follow is very similar to what the internet follows as well, right? It's called the end-to-end -end design principle, that the network is dumb, right? It only cares about doing very specific operations. In the case of internet, it's like just delivering packets from point A to point B. Uh, and, and most of the intelligence actually happens at the edges or, or at the clients, right? Similarly, you're using the Bitcoin network which is very, very good at actually making sure that you get consensus on, on, on the state of the system and you get total ordering on the order of operations. 
right? And then we can actually build the intelligence at the edges and which are the block store nodes for us. <clears throat> so at this layer, what you basically get is a mapping between uh, a human readable name, let's say Muneeb, and a hash, which is the value of, of, of that key pair, right? And the data is actually stored outside of the blockchain, right? The, the default is a DHT, a distributed hash table. Uh, so DHTs are actually, uh, if, if you look at you know, how they've evolved, they started in the late 90s and early uh, 2000s, and there was, people were really excited about distributed hash tables back in the days. Right? Uh, like my, a couple of my, my professors you know, uh, worked on it and they spent their entire lives or their research careers basically just doing DSG research. And they were actually motivated by similar things that the Bitcoin community is motivated by. People have talked about building a decentralized DNS. People have talked about building a decentralized storage system. People have talked about building decentralized PKI, all using DHTs, right? But um, they mostly found out that DHTs have like severe design flaws. Uh, one problem is Sybil attacks. Anyone can just boot, you know, a thousand or two thousand nodes, try to take over it the entire DHT or at least a specific space within the DHT. Similarly, uh, DHTs tend to work well at, at small scale, but as you start getting into large scales, you, so you start uh, getting into all sort of reliability issues and corner cases because the DHTs don't have a sense of global state, unlike Bitcoin. Bitcoin has global state. Right? Like everyone is, is on the same page for what the state of the system is supposed to be. Uh, while knowing all of these potential issues with DHTs, we still went forward uh, for using a DHT as the default data store because we actually think that the blockchain can actually help solve some of the problems with the DHT. And I'll actually uh, talk more about it in a, in a later slide. So in our system, uh, you can think of like this as if you compare this to uh, DNS, and let's say you're doing a query on CNN.com. Uh, the CNN.com part is registered here. The IP address is, in, in case of DNS, you're getting it from a root server or, or a cache that is near you, but the, the, the record is being fetched from the DHT. Right, and then we have all these mirrors that try to make sure that they periodically rebroadcast all the information so the data is not lost in the DHT and so on. But there's nothing special about uh, using a DHT other than this nice decentralization property that anyone can just run a node and be a part of the network. You can actually very easily replace it with other cloud storage providers. And we start getting into this, this distinction between having a control plane and a data plan, right? Uh, most of, of the security and access control is taken care by the Bitcoin blockchain and the, and the virtual blockchain, but for the data plane, you can actually use existing distributed systems, right? There's no need to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, and, and Jude is sitting here, actually done a lot of work in, um, in, 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 in making a new storage system that treats things like S3, Dropbox, or any vanilla Linux system as a dumb drive. You put encrypted data on these things, and, and you can keep adding support for other uh, cloud storage providers, but just writing these storage drivers, right? So we actually use a variation of a system like that. We already have uh, storage drivers for S3 and Linux, I think, two, two right now, not for Dropbox. Uh, but the idea is that you really don't have to use the DHT as a data store. You can also very easily use existing cloud providers. Because when you fetch the data, you can hash it and you can check that the hash was correct from the Bitcoin blockchain. Right? Secure, the, the data plane uh, is not there for security at all. Right? It's only there for actually delivering the data. So some of the features of uh, block store. Well, obviously it's open source. It's actually written in Python, which I feel is a nice property because there seem to be a lot more Python developers in the community, and, and the code tends to be like somewhat, somewhat simpler to understand. Uh, there is no blockchain functionality there. There's, you, don't, you never deal with consensus. So uh, 
when you're operating at the block store level, it's actually much simpler and much nicer. Again, uh, you can get unlimited data because unlike the limits you had with Namecoin where you can only put 520 bytes in, literally in the blockchain, you can potentially have unlimited data because you can link it not just to the DST but also to cloud storage providers as I uh, talked about earlier. Uh, this is very interesting, right? So what happened with um, Namecoin was that they had a very simple uh, pricing mechanism. They, they started with, with, a, with a certain price per key value new pair, and the price was supposed to drop uh, every X amount of months, right? And the, and the idea there was that most of the valuable names would get picked up initially, and what would be left like a year or two after the launch would be names that no one really wants, so they should be very cheap. What actually ended up happening was that nobody knew about Namecoin initially, uh, and as the price started going down, uh, there was a lot of squatting. Um, so this, this, this professor, Arvind, at, at Princeton actually wrote a paper about it where they analyzed the namespace that uh, Namecoin used for the .bit domain, and they found out that out of the 190,000 names registered, less than 1% had any valuable information as the key pair. Every, everything else was actually spam. Uh, which shows that in a, in a decentralized naming system, squatting is actually a big problem. So uh, what we ended up doing was like we have much more intelligent pricing mechanisms, and they're also there for, on a per namespace basis. Right? Uh, so you can have multiple namespaces for example, like .id, which is what we use for blockchain IDs. Uh, there could be .xti, I think Drummond is sitting here. Uh, over there, for people who don't know, it's a, it's a standard uh, in, in the online identity community. And you can have like a namespace for Internet of Things if you want to register like your device, uh, give it a unique ID. And, and they can have different pricing rules, right? Like you don't want, uh, for example, a name of a of an IoT device is not important, right? So names would probably be free in that namespace. Whereas names in the, in the .id namespace that we use, we actually came up with, with an algorithm that looks at how valuable this name should be, uh, based both on the length of the name and also like if there are any numeric characters or weird characters in the name. So John would be more expensive than John 1. Uh, so it's, it, it is somewhat intelligent, uh, but at the same time, we encourage people to experiment with other pricing mechanisms or even build like auction systems uh, on top because that functionality is, is there. Uh, yes, so it, when someone is starting a new namespace, they actually get to decide what pricing structure this namespace will follow and if the names are going to expire, when should they expire, or maybe they shouldn't expire at all. Right? So the person who starts a namespace only gets these special privileges when you're starting the namespace. When the namespace has been, uh, exists, like they have no control on the namespace anymore. So it's a completely decentralized system, but it gives people uh, the ability to start new namespaces. And this is a really nice property, actually, that because we had to migrate from Namecoin to Bitcoin ourselves, we were actually, we actually thought a lot about how to future-proof the system that if we will have to migrate again to some other blockchain, let's say 20 years down the road, uh, would that be possible? So uh, you can actually import an entire existing namespace. A, a good exercise would be to actually try to import the .com namespace from root DNS servers uh, to the blockchain. And similarly, you can actually export a namespace and move to, to another blockchain if you want. So this is the uh, DSG part that I wanted to talk about. And uh, it, it's a very interesting property. We uh, will probably release a, a paper about it. Uh, so we use Kademlia uh, as the DSG routing protocol, which is what uh, BitTorrent uses as well. But the, the difference that we have from uh, like pure Kademlia is actually two parts. One is that Kademlia, usually when people um, have a peer-to-peer -peer DSG network, it's open in the sense that anyone can just do writes on the network, right? We modified this and made it a, a content address DHT, which means, yes, you can write any value you want, but the, the key needs to be the hash of the value. 
which means that if I write something, you can't really erase it because the only value you can write is my profile, <coughs> the hash of the key, uh, the key needs to match the hash of the value. Right? So what you would end up doing is you would end up effectively republishing my key pair. Right? The, the second thing that we did was that we actually <coughs> tried to rate limit how much you can write to the DHT based on if the hash was actually announced in the blockchain or not. So, so the blockchain pretty much acts as a secure index that the DHT would reject a write if you did not pay the price to actually broadcast the transaction in, in the blockchain. Right? So in a completely decentralized manner, you could do similar things with DHTs earlier as well by introducing these gatekeepers, but it, it defeats the purpose if you have a centralized gatekeeper that is trying to guard what can and cannot be written to a decentralized uh, storage layer. But, but in this case, we replace the centralized gatekeeper with a decentralized blockchain uh, to, to make it a completely decentralized system. And what we haven't uh, implemented yet, but we, we, we have plans to work on it sometime soon, is that you can actually also protect the routing tables of the DHT using the blockchain as well. Uh, and I, I wouldn't get too much into it in this talk, but feel free to talk to us afterwards. So, uh, yes, so we did the migration uh, starting somewhere start of September. Uh, so people on coinsecrets.org, they actually noticed a bunch of off-return transactions. And for the Bitcoin core dev sitting here, it's only the current system where you need to send one transaction per ID. We are already working on a new system where you can actually um, pack multiple transactions of, of the virtual chain in a single Bitcoin transaction, right? So, so our intent is not to bloat the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain at all, uh, and hopefully that, that system should uh, get rolled out pretty soon. So uh, we, we did the migration. I think uh, the stats are something like when we migrated our, our 30 to 33,000 users, we ended up using 29% of all op return transactions ever done on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and and uh, the system is live, uh, it's, it's open source, you can go and uh, play around with it. And uh, what I'm going to switch to now is something that where, where does this lead us, right? Like this was the naming part, that you can do naming and do storage. But uh, a very interesting thing that is happening now is that there is, let's first, uh, I'll give you a quick like uh, overview of how this works. So let's say I want to look up now Werner's ID. So on this system is Werner.id because that's the namespace. And you will get the Bitcoin address that owns this ID. And you will actually get when was it first registered, when was it renewed, and what is the value. So this is the value hash of his profile that you can then look up uh, I'm not showing the, the full profile here, but this is the JSON data that uh, he wrote in his profile, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a very simple system. You can just play around with it, do pip install block store, and you'll get this ability uh, on your command line. So uh, one interesting thing that started happening is that a kind of like a blockchain <laughs> application stack has started to emerge. That there are people who want to write decentralized applications, and they want to write it on the strongest blockchain, which happens to be the Bitcoin blockchain, right? So the idea is that can we actually try to uh, build common components that a lot of these application developers can reuse? So some of the things that we have identified at the core layer, so this is the blockchain layer that gives you consensus and reliable broadcast. On top of that, uh, we, what we are calling state engines is basically how you process the transactions from the base layer and build a, a state of your system. In our case, the state is, is the state of the namespace, that who owns a certain name, what is the value attached with that name, but it's basically intelligence, right? It's, it's very easy to uh, write a different type of state engine that processes transactions broadcasted on the Bitcoin blockchain to build some sort of a different system that cares about some other type of states. Right? And uh, the DHT pretty much acts as immutable storage because once you write a certain key value pair and you want to update the value, you'll need to do a new transaction announcing the new hash of the value. 
So it's in that sense, it's kind of like immutable data or immutable storage, where uh, for every update, you actually need to broadcast the new hash of the value, right? But it's also possible to build mutable storage, and in fact, Jude has already built that, where uh, what you do is you don't put, put information on what is the value that you should expect uh, that the, the hash of that value should map uh, what's in the blockchain, but you actually just give people information on your public keys that are going to sign the data that, that you're going to get, and you give them information on how to fetch that data. So this is mutable storage because you can now keep changing that data. Let's say you're just writing to your S3 bucket and you're signing data with your public key, and users can now discover which bucket should I fetch the data from and what is the public key that I should expect that the data should be signed by, right? So we, we support both these, these models today uh, with Bloxroom. And from there, you can actually try to build some sort of a API interface for other applications, right? So again, this kind of like becomes the, the distributed core and this becomes the application space on top which for people uh, who work in operating systems, it's, it's a very interesting analogy because uh, if you look at Unix, this is the syscall layer. A lot of complexity is handled below syscalls, but the app developers never have to worry about it. Right? The difference here is that this itself is actually a peer-to-peer -peer systems which are collaborating to give you some sort of a functionality, but the apps don't need to care about it. Right? For the apps, it's basically, hey, I want to read uh, the value on Muneeb's ID, or I want to fetch the data that is in some S3 bucket or, or a Dropbox folder, right? And, and this is what you can actually collaborate on because a lot of app developers want to build these things, not this, right? So this should be completely open source. A lot of people can actually collaborate uh, on it and try to build applications on top, which is exactly what we are doing uh, with the Blockstack community. Right, so if you go to, to go to blockstack.org, uh, it's an open source community for people who want to build applications on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, right? Or the strongest blockchain, which happens to be Bitcoin. Right? We have a Slack channel with around 400 people now. Uh, we had our first summit for engineers in New York that got like around 120 engineers, uh, and we're very excited about the work that is going on here. So with that, check out blockstack.org, and you can uh, see our GitHub where most of these uh, software layers that I talked about are available. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? So, uh, Sorry, yeah, let's say. yeah uh, he's basically asking that uh, if I go to the DMV, how would you see this system interacting with the offline world uh, and not, not just the online world, right? Uh, so what I did not show, and uh, I was talking to somebody that I should have really had an overview picture of like how Blockstore fits into the bigger picture, because that's not the only piece of software. Um, uh, we have something called resolvers, Think of them as DNS resolvers, right? But they're actually blockchain-based resolvers. Similarly, we have things called registrars. Like there's a repo you can go and see. And that's for someone who wants to register users in bulk on this system, all the code. That's the code that we, we use as well. And, and similarly, we have other applications like blockchain auth is, is, is one repo you'll find, which uh, lets people authenticate and log into websites using blockchain-based uh, <coughs> authentication. Right, so we, I only just focused on block store, which was a naming layer and the, and the storage layer in this stack. Uh, so what, in, in the scenario that you're describing, what would end up happening is that the DMV would need to have access to a resolver to be able to check that, you know, uh, like what's the information on this ID or is this ID already taken, right? And they would have some sort of access to a registrar where they would be able to put in new information and, and send it to the blockchain. Right. 
I was just following that with it. You're saying that a uh, state actor would be able to write uh, possibly immutable information into an identity that you can't really deny to a technology. So, so yeah, that was one example I gave. Like uh, out of the discussions that we've had with people, it seems like w what's a more likely scenario is that people would initially just register these blockchain IDs and use them online, like for simple use cases, just log into a website and you know this is a unique username. And then you can start getting into third parties like uh, BlockScore. They do KYC checks to sign statements about those IDs. Like BlockScore could actually do a KYC check on a blockchain ID and be, and be able to say that, hey, this person is actually over 21. Right. And similarly, way down the road, you could actually be able to get the DMV of New York to be able to sign a statement about an established blockchain ID. Yeah. For my application to use your system, it seems like does that mean that it needs to run a full load to like have the full history of the chain? Yeah, so it, it, it uh, yes. So what he's asking is that do I need to run a full node so that I have the full history of the, of the chain? And that, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that uh, Namecoin had was the ability to have an SPV like client, and we are actually working on a new version of Blockstore that would enable that. So you don't no, you don't need to have the full node. You, you will be able to have an SPV like thin client that you can run. Do you guys have any more questions? Yeah. What about DNS? Did you abandon that? Or what are your plans for DNS? Uh, I feel like. Uh, question. Yes. So what about DNS, right? The domain name system. Uh, I feel like. If you ignore the political side of it, which I know is a very, very hard thing to do, and most probably that's the real limitation, uh, from a technical point of view, this, this system uh, has two major advantages over DNS. Uh, the first thing is that it gives you explicit cache invalidation, which means that as soon as someone updates their mapping of the domain name, everyone who is running a full node now knows that this has been updated. So I actually wrote um, a caching layer where I was keeping all of this information in memory. And for doing that with DNS is a pain, right? That's why sometimes domain name updates take up to 24 hours. Uh, for us, the worst case scenario is, is a block time, right? As soon as a new block is announced, because there's only one channel that can actually update information, you have explicit cache invalidation. Secondly, you're now no longer dependent on a federated system. Right? Uh, it, basically, the root servers are the authoritative source for all data for DNS. And in this case, you replace the root servers with the blockchain. Right? So both these technical advantages over classic DNS are, uh, I feel, are very exciting. But the political side of just using the existing system is going to be the real hurdle in actually trying to replace DNS. So, so you're not doing anything with one name to try to make those things? Probably we are we're not uh, currently we are not trying to uh, mirror information from DNS servers. Although it will be a very interesting exercise to do, uh, just to run a full mirror that is blockchain based and tell people that hey, instead of running a DNS resolver, try this resolver. Or you can even like do something simpler that you can um, make our resolvers backwards compatible in the sense that if it's a query for a .com or a .org or something, just uh, send it to a DNS resolver, but try to, that would help in deployment for these new types of resolvers that do both blockchain and uh, legacy DNS. So you're not trying to replace the endpoints No, n not at all. Like we would actually encourage them to like try to move to this uh, 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 and have your dot bit on, on the new software. Any more questions? There's one more question over there. Sorry, this is the incentive for the Okay, that, that's actually a great question because uh, we are still in the middle of figuring out incentives for running the individual DHG nodes. We have, we have figured out how to protect them against civil attacks, but the incentives for uh, running nodes are not that clear. 
uh, and that's partly the reason why our model is slightly hybrid. That there is the DHT that is like decentralized, and you know people who really care about uh, uh, that they can they can actually just write data to their DHT. But then there could be service providers like our company that is running a classic you know cloud storage based system that mirrors all the information. And yes, you are somewhat reliant that what if our mirror goes down, uh, what happens to the data? But if there are enough parties, enough vested parties that are running their own mirrors, it's actually uh, a, a, a pretty good system, I, I feel. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Manish, for your awesome Well, before I finish, uh, a lot of people have actually done a lot of hard work on what I presented. Uh, Jude is sitting right there. Ryan Shea is hanging out somewhere. So uh, I, I want to give them a hand of applause.